I wanted to rewind almost a full year ago. This is an idea I had yesterday during the show. It hit me while I was talking about the no trade clause with Ted Leonsis and his involvement in giving Bradley Beal that. And I went, well, I wonder what he actually said a year ago about this. Like, what was the public comment? I should probably star that. Let's circle back to it tomorrow. And, and thus, I, it took me uh, 30 seconds to go back in our archives because obviously we cut that very important piece of audio last year on this show. We were about 10 days into doing this show uh, the first thing that happened on this show, basically, we had Tommy Shepard on show number one. Uh, I asked him, are you going to give Beal the contract? And he was basically like, yeah. Um, and then a couple of days later, they do. They officially sign him to the extension. And ultimately, uh, they, they hold a press conference. I think it was on July 8th um, after signing him unofficially on the 30th. The moratorium ends on like the 6th. Woohoo, press conference, big celebration. Bradley Beal's going to be a wizard for life. Here we are, less than a year later, Bradley Beal is on his way to the Phoenix Suns. So what did Leonsa say about this no-trade clause? And I, I think before I hit play on this, it is important for me to reiterate something that I have. I don't know if you want to call it reported, stated. I'll call it reported. I'll, I, will, I will put that journalistic gravitas to this statement. I have reported, as have others, it's not original reporting by any stretch, that it was essentially Leonsis who gave Beal the no-trade clause. That it was not that for all of the mistakes that Tommy Shepard made, some of which feel like bigger mistakes now with the benefit of hindsight uh, than they did at the time, even for all the mistakes that Shepard made. Tommy Shepard didn't want to give Bradley Beal a no trade clause. He's the general manager. He doesn't want to handcuff himself. Why would he do that? No other player in the league has it. There is no precedent for that. But whether it was directly Leonsis or or Leonsis handcuffing Shepard into it by saying, do whatever it takes to keep him happy, and then Beal going, well, let's see how far we can milk this, and then Shepard being like, well, it said do whatever to keep him happy, and he wants the no-trade clause, so I better not say no. Whether it was direct or indirect, that level of detail, I do not know. But it certainly was Leonsis, uh, the feeling of those that were involved in around this this extension. Um it, it was certainly a feeling like that was Leonsis' call. That's that's what I've been told. Take it for what it is. So, with that said, Leonsis asked last year at the press conference with Beal, what was the impetus? What's the reasoning? Why in the world did you give Bradley Beal the no-trade clause? You have to trust me that I just, I've come back from a lot of league meetings. Okay, hold on. Anytime you start an answer as a billionaire with, you've got to trust me, I'm already skeptical, but continue, Mr. Leonsis. You have to trust me that I just, I've come back from a lot of league meetings. I'm back on my way out to Vegas and several fellow NBA owners have said, um, I wish we had a relationship like you have with your players. There's a lot of um, movement, a lot of non-partnership that you see around the league, and for there to be a public statement that essentially says we have a player who wants to be here and serve out his contract, as do we, uh, that allows your general manager to plan and to be able to have the confidence that your best player, um, your bedrock player, is a part of the process. I'm going to pause it there because there are two possibilities on that. One that is on some level genuine. And I, I've always thought Ted comes across as like a pretty empathetic, like real human being. So I tend to think that there is on some level a, a realistic something there to that, that I, I don't want to belittle. I don't want to, you know, it's not even, it's definitely not punching down. Like I host a radio show. He's a billionaire owns an NBA team. It's not punching down, but like, I don't want, I don't want to feel like I'm taking pot shots at Leonsis, even though a lot of people in these seats do. And I've certainly probably taken a few over the years, but at the end of the day, like the relationship element to sports is something that I think Leonsis genuinely cherishes. And Sports would, for fans, be a lot better if everyone kind of acted that way. Because you could build 
things over years, which includes relationships with fans and like rooting for the same players, as opposed to this NBA that we have where 25, 30, 40 percent of the league, if not more, moves every off season. Like good luck buying a jersey unless it's Giannis's or or Jokic's. Like if you're a Phoenix Suns fan who bought a Chris Paul jersey two years ago, you probably felt pretty good that Chris Paul would be there with Devin Booker and they would, you know, they make the finals and like, yeah, Chris Paul is going to rot it out in Phoenix till he retires. Now he's maybe going to have to have a Wizards jersey printed for him or he's going to have a buyout or whatever. You know, if you're a Clippers fan, you might even get to use that old Chris Paul jersey that you put in the back of your closet. Like, it's crazy. There, There's a graphic going around that if uh, Paul plays here in Washington, the Westbrook, Paul, John Wall trio will have just been traded for each other to the point that they've all played for the same teams. They will have all played for, obviously, Paul will have more, um, but... They will have all played for Washington, Houston, and the Clippers. All three of Paul Westbrook and Wall. It's nuts. But the idea, the other, the other side of that, the more cynical take on that is that other owners think Ted Leonsis is a sucker. And they tell him like, hey, man, great job with that no trade clause. I wish we had that. And then they walk out of the room laughing, going, man, that guy stinks at business. That guy gave up all his leverage in the name of partnership. Because here's the, here's the flaw, right? Forget who thinks who is what. Let's just talk about the business. The business is you gave all of the leverage to Bradley Beal for nothing. Because he could still come to you and be like, I want out of here. And sure, you could enforce that leverage and be like, well, we don't want to trade you, so get out there and play. But that's not really how the league works. Star players force their way out and they get their wishes because teams would would prefer to not have disgruntled superstars that aren't going to perform at their, the high level and be poisoned in their locker rooms and, and all of those things. And so when Beal decides he wants out, you then can go like, okay, well, we'll trade you, but it ain't, and you can tell us where you prefer to go and we can try, but we're only going to do it if it works for us too. And in that case, even if Beal didn't necessarily, like if he would have preferred Phoenix, but would have been okay with Miami, he gives them maybe a list. And then the Wizards can at least be like, all right, hey, here's what we got. We got a deal on the table from Phoenix. That's not really on the table though. So I know that's where you want to go, but they can't offer us enough. Miami can offer us more. It's far from your wife's family, which is something that's important to you. So if you're willing to play for the Sacramento Kings, we like their deal. We'll send you to Sacramento. You get the choice. Sacramento, Miami, which one you want. And you at least then have two teams bidding against each other, if not, you know, three or four. other. And if you wanted to be hard about it, be like, well, you said you were committed for five years. You wanted out. Tough, tough cookies. We're sending you to Minnesota. We're sending you to you know, Boston. We're sending you to wherever. It's not how it went down. He said, I want Phoenix. Phoenix is the only spot. And the Wizards had no choice because he actually had the power. So the idea that Leonsis does this in the name of partnership instead of realizing that it was just bad business and Beal, of all people, had no way to remote... I mean... Steph Curry doesn't have the leverage to do this. Because here's the thing. NBA players can sign for more money with their team that that it would be letting them go, right? The incumbent team. Than they can with a new team. So all you have to do is look at Bradley Beal, Stephen Curry, LeBron James, any NBA player and go, and it, I'll use the Beal specifically in this case, and go, you want to know trade clause? Okay, fine. Negotiate it in a contract with another team who's going to pay you $50 million less. If you want to, if, if it's so important to you to be in control of your future, you go ahead, you hit free agency, 
and sacrifice the 50 million. And you want to know what not any of them is going to do? Sacrifice the 50 million. It's not going to happen. And so you already have the leverage to not force them, but push them back to the nest with which they would otherwise fly, a.k.a. back to you. And instead, with $50 million already in their offer more than any other team could offer him, the Wizards were like, oh, you want that too? Here you go. It was asinine then. The way it played out proved that. And the idea that this was in any way a partnership that allowed for a quote-unquote long-term planning was either an entire misread of the situation and just a misunderstanding of how business is done in the league by Leonsis and Shepard or a farce messaging something to try to sell it when they just got their ass handed to them in a negotiation by Mark Bartlestein. Like, I hate that it's that harsh, but like, I don't know how to do a nice version of this. To me, that is the nice version of this. It was bad. They lost the negotiation. They got absolutely run over. And now we see a year later, the results. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.